yeah so so you were you were explaining uh, you know with with itc and how um, correct so uh, th- th- those are only those are only thoughts. examples when i say that you know to be in defensive is a strategy but look at it defensives are of two kinds like i was saying there are defensives of the consumer kind where there is a, also a divide between uh, some like a very high quality companies like unilever have corrected a uh, colgate is at a 52 week low i mean for all your while it was being treated as or almost close to 52 week low and it was being treated it's always been treated as a defensive stock and a lot of traditional pharma companies uh, that have been uh, the bell wether of markets whenever corrections have happened because they are more sustained in their earnings have also corrected substantially uh and then there are other consumer companies that may not have corrected but at the same time they have hardly performed in the last two years so there is not much the word correction there itself is a misnomer because they have sort of stagnated in what they are doing and um, so the one part of my thought process is that there is there has to be one part of your portfolio uh, now whether that is 33% whether it is 20% whether it is 15% or it is whatever x percentage is something that you have to define by your comfort which is going to be like a steady uh, batsman in your team that is able to hold the wickets uh, when when uh, you know uh, is able to hold the crease when the wickets are tumbling now if you look at the structure of the market right now at least this is my reading and again with the standard disclosure that i am a personal investor and not a savvy registered advisor relative to the market there has been an, a massive outperformance by banks and as also by uh, large it uh i will not count into this necessarily tcs although it has been extremely steady and it has been a market outperformer because tcs was also undergoing a buyback and uh, since today was the last day of the buyback there has been a very small 4% odd correction in tcs but but even then it has been a bell wether stock and it's been a fantastic wealth creator for many people so some part of your money must go in a stability and why it should go in stability is because the gyrations of the market or the or the volatility of the market is so high every hour a news is coming from russia every hour the news is becoming extremely difficult to interpret because uh, the, there this is an unprecedented sort of a development sometimes you split a country and say two people we are now two parts are moving out the rest of the world says i do not recognize it you go back into treaties the world says they are going to impose sanctions now in reality try and understand how difficult this tug of war is if the world decides to impose sanctions on china and the world decides to impose sanctions on russia the world shrinks also which is which is counterproductive to a lot of economies around the world so it's a very precarious situation uh, where a lot of diplomacy is required and this makes the task of uh, investing at least in the short term extremely extremely uh, difficult and burdensome whereas over a longer term period even if you look at the returns of the market in situations of war uh you will find that the returns of the market have been extremely uh, more beneficial over a over a period you know once you've crossed the one to two months period usually the market bounces back now you know i was uh, while i will elaborate on the portfolio part and i was just talking about a certain percentage of your portfolio into defenses uh, i will tell you that i uh, as a individual love reading books on psychology and uh, human behavior and it is a very interesting thing that when the market falls in a very short window like it has corrected from january to now uh, what happens is that every human being tries to become extremely protective and in the desire to become protective he uh, you know uh, he gives up the ability to think long term and embraces what is falling least so the, the therefore for example on twitter people will say but warren buffett is quoted very frequently when the market falls and people will then come and say you know whatever i owned till yesterday which were my darling stocks now are no longer darling stocks and i'll buy all defenses and from tomorrow morning i'll be the most disciplined investor but that's not what uh, neither does in my interpretation neither does buffett say that nor is that the actual way to behave in the market what warren buffett according to me uh, from all the books that i've read on him um, and i've read a, f- a fairly large number of books and blogs and articles and letters of 50 years etc talks when he talks about margin of safety it is commensurate to the returns that you're going to get it does not mean that you cannot dip uh, in the short run it means that if the opportunity before you is sizable 
and you have a holding period that's why he uses the expression forever uh, and the company continues to behave like a good uh, child or a good uh, stock or whatever you want to call it in your portfolio then uh, because the margin of safety is intact you will you will do a good job in terms of capital allocation and continue holding the thing so my interpretation out of this is he does not qualify and say that it is only companies with stronger moats because the moat itself is relative to valuation and moats themselves get destroyed and uh, depleted by uh, innovation and by the emergence of new companies and that's why the market will always have new heroes new sectors a lot of the uh, you know world class companies have to reinvent themselves many of them bow out of uh, standard and poor uh, 500 and similarly out of a nifty and out of a sensex so in a broad sense first part of the portfolio should be allocated to what you think are leaders where they have very strong balance sheets either because of cash or because of the nature of the uh, transformation that is under play as an example in this current market uh, say like i gave an example of banks there are uh, you know the metal stocks particularly in the, on the aluminum side seem to be extremely stable because the world situation appears to be very favorable for companies like hindalco and nalco and whatever other Uh, companies are in the on the non ferrous side so so th- you can decide according to your uh, uh, according to whatever you are thinking what percentage you want to put into the defensives now what will the de- defensives do if you actually look at the behavior of the market in the last few days you will discover that a certain group of stocks have fallen way less than the market i gave you the examples of it i'm giving you the examples of uh, uh, companies like hindalco and nalco and then there would be some many other examples uh, the, even in the chemical side while the chemical market may have corrected there may be companies like srf that are holding uh, relatively strong to the market uh, and I, I, again these examples are only meant to give you an idea you don't go by the fact that i'm recommending the skip i'm only trying to say that make a certain slot of companies that will be stable if you look at for example uh, textile names also there are companies in the textile sphere which have been very very stable in this market correction why are they stable because they may be beneficiaries of china plus one they may be beneficiaries of the fact that they are completely integrated and therefore at are at an advantage to companies based in bangladesh uh, compared to companies based in bangladesh or other parts and all the th- they may be at the verge of certain you know they may be safeguarding themselves from raw material price increases or exposure unnecessary exposure which is concentrated in only a few buyers that are sort of mitigating the risk once you have sorted this part of the portfolio the second part of the portfolio is to look at very seasoned players that's what i am doing look at very seasoned players that is leaders in their respective sectors who are getting rogered in this market for just the fact that in the quarter or one quarter or two quarter before they have actually reported what may be called as a lackluster performance but in reality is the stress on the raw material side which appears in some cases to be a temporary problem <coughs> so if you are able to identify some of these companies that are otherwise very strong but are right now broken down as an example they may be they may be companies that are mnc leaders and those mnc leaders have also i'm just giving an example i'm just again don't i mean you can exfoliate this to and apply it to many other things but they may have corrected 20 to 25% which is a very sizable correction for the kind of technology they have or the leadership they have or the pedigree of management they have the second and yet they are at the onset in many cases of a, a capex revival in some cases they are beneficiaries of uh, india being a very high focus area for outsourcing as an export hub if you look at a lot of mnc companies they will become very strong sources of export in times to come uh, and not only mnc a lot of manufacturing companies are in the same basket i'm just using mnc as a example uh, and at the same time they will continue to reward you by both capital allocation skills as also by uh, enriching you with dividends and if required buybacks if the stock sort of you know doesn't behave well because the promoter will never sell so there you also have the benefit of studying ple 
uh, PLI. And then you study and you say that, look, there are some of these companies have applied and you try and see what is the rational, what do they want to do? Why are they wanting to become production bases? Do they have an advantage vis-a-vis -vis raw materials? Now, I, just as an example, I'm not again going to name any stocks. If you actually believe that Make in India is going to do well, then Make in India itself will require a lot of raw materials to do well. So some of the companies uh, may be very well positioned from a raw material perspective. And I'm not saying that I will I own these stocks. I'm just giving you a thought process. For example, some company may be, be if you look at this particular market, some of the outperformance in this market has come from companies that are actually being able to supply power or being able to supply, you know, companies like ONGC uh, and uh, some whatever the company names uh, uh, exist in those sectors. Again, I didn't want to get into stock specifics. So you look at you look at a second line and you come and say here the growth is going to be very good. It will be higher than the GDP growth, and the companies are well positioned because of their uniqueness to do well. So when the market tries to rebound, which inevitably it will from what level is a matter of debate, but that inevitably it will, these companies will be able to give a return on your portfolio, which is probably way higher than the defensives. And if the market takes time to rebound, as it has done from 1st of January to now with the sort of drip by drip fall, uh, you when you see a 1% fall, it doesn't sound too much. When you say 1% fall for con continuous 7 or 8 or 10 or 12 days, it becomes much more meaningful because it's also compounding at a lesser level. I mean, the sense of compounding effect of the fall it keeps getting more bigger and better. Bigger, not better, sorry, bigger. So the second line is to have companies in that sphere. The third line of uh, basically investing is to look at companies that are disrupting. Now, some of these companies, that is, they're disrupting. They've had a heady, heavy uh, run-up. But the run-up, according to you, is real for whatever reason that you've articulated in writing. Whether it is in the form of green energy, whether it is in the form of hydrogen, whether it is in the form of, you know, some company that is basically, you know, being able to discover something that is very disruptive to the market, etc. If the story of that company is on exponential growth, uh, and like I said, uh, I put a lot of companies into export in that segment. If those companies, because of the high quality of products that some of these companies have, if those companies are in the trajectory that they will be able to grow for a sustained period of time, then the, that's where a lot of your returns will come. And I'm not a guy who likes to use the word multi-bagger, but you will make substantial returns. So I have right now at least... Uh, from my uh, perspective, position my portfolio into these three slots. Uh, my definition of defenses not only includes, uh, does not necessarily include consumer. I believe that uh, the healthcare sector in India is way better positioned. And while I've held this position in the market right from the time when COVID came, I think people are overreacting to the fact that hospitals and medical uh, related facilities will, fear, will for, see a drawdown just because COVID is going. In fact, I feel that the earnings will go up. A lot of these people have gone in for uh, capacity expansions. Um, uh, and therefore, if the price is right, which is very critical for you to evaluate because some correction has happened or some earning growth has happened or some, you know, some interesting development has happened in the company, then you will sustain. And uh, the reason this is also showing up in the prices of some of these companies. Again, if I give you examples, it amounts to a sort of a recommendation or, an, or indication of my ownership. But some of these companies are holding up very well. Well, others have corrected. So I'll talk about the ones that have corrected no, rather than the ones that are holding. See, for example, Metropolis or Apollo Hospital may have corrected way more than uh, or, or at least illusion from an illusionary perspective. They looks like they've corrected. But if you actually look at the returns of the stock over a one or two year period, uh, then the, the, you know, the sort of uh, current market price also reflects an outperformance. It doesn't necessarily reflect, uh, uh, at least in the case of a company like Apollo, Max and Fortis and others have actually not even fallen in this entire market crack. They're not even holding, they're not even falling down. So that is the bas first basket of uh, sort of defensives uh, that, uh, you know, that are in the healthcare sector. 
the second are certain companies in the chemical sector that continue to have a unique advantage they may be monopolies in their way the monopoly can come either because of the uh, unique chemical uh, composition they have or the, just the size and the scalability that they have accomplished in order to become low cost producers so uh, w- one of the reasons why companies uh, so certain companies like uh, and again by example srf etc not correcting is because they they are right now positioned uh in a way to grow uh, which is way which is one of the ways the market gets confused that should i call the growth company that is able to churn out a lot of cash and has good financials also to sort of uh, degrade itself in this fall because they'll always be takers the third are you know in the category of defensives or, or in the second category of the portfolio are companies that have a very good feel about the future because because like a set of capex cycles now the capex cycles may be because of uh, expansion that they have undertaken it may be because of their past debt which they has been completely retired uh, i there are a lot of companies in the market that are actually moved to zero debt and the sheer savings of the uh, interest rate on those companies will be a huge cash generation that will either go into uh, growth or it will go and back come back to in the form of dividends so uh, uh, if you look at it from that perspective and if you had constructed your portfolio uh, i am not trying to hide the fact that the market has fallen and i am not trying to hide the fact that a lot of uh, you know uh, pain maybe have been felt by a lot of people particularly uh, people who were new entrants to the market compared to people who have been in the market for a longer period of time well actually sorry i'm going to correct this people who could have been in, in the market for a longer period of time if they were holding the wrong stocks and they got no returns for them the returns of 2020 or 2021 would have also been meaningless but i'm saying people who otherwise would have made money would be uh, smart enough to see that uh, you know uh, the uh, certain part of the portfolio is actually being immune now again if i let if i look at my top holding and i'm not going to talk about my holding but if i look at my top holdings in some of my good companies or at least ones that i believe have not even corrected 5 to 7% from their highs whereas there may be other stocks that i also own which may have corrected even 25% so what wh- am i going to lose faith in the ones that have fallen 25% the answer is no because there is an ideology around them there is currently they, you see i'll give an example if there is a person who's sitting in the market and he has for example either a leverage and therefore he has to sell another person who cannot bear the loss and he sees the stock fall 20% and he he totally confused and he starts dumping that stock it always all ends up having a sort of a contagion effect uh, even to in today's market look at the way the market recovered from minus 1150 points on the bsc sensex to some 300 odd points but there was hardly any recovery in the mid cap and small caps Uh, or very very you know uh, uh, feeble recovery in the mid cap so th- these are all temperament related issues and therefore if you look at your holistic portfolio and you say i've got somebody who's batting for me somebody who's bowling for me somebody who's today seems to be knocked out but is otherwise a person who will come and score a uh, hit a six or score a home run uh, then your portfolio is relatively more insulated in the market now let me assure you we are all humans we all make mistakes we all get uh, a hit i don't like to see any dip in my portfolio at all I, even if i have gone up 100% 200% 300% and my portfolio falls 5% i don't feel very good uh, about it because i just want to do justice and the only way i can do justice is to try and become rational at that point of time rationality at that point of time if you are not able to decipher the market means do nothing if you are able to deploy money then deploy money if you are able to deploy money and you are you scared of it deploy it over a, a sort of a repeated trance so do a little bit today a little, little bit on another day a little bit on something and similarly on rise so you follow all the good traits of what all these you know veteran investors all smart books etc have documented and uh, uh, de- and uh, when the market turns around it will give you a, a immense amount of opportunity to again make wealth because there is a if you just for one second uh, remove this world and just look at india which is not the way you should but i'm just giving an example then the situation in india appears to be very con- uh, conducive uh, to uh, the stock market compounding at least for the next few years 
so i i will pause here first because sir, you know i've spoken uh, non stop and i want to ensure that people have digested it and of course if they have any uh, specific things to discuss or things now what was the de- debate happening last night and why was it why were people reacting so favorably to my talk last night because yesterday people were in a sense of mayhem they were they had come on chat as if to assume that the market has to open 2000 points down and then there will be a circuit and because everybody feels that russia has gone down 15% therefore nobody will buy and they will have no liquidity etc so there were many debates that we were trying to have first of all why would everybody have to come and dump the stocks so the first point is that you don't have to dump the stocks because the market was in their assessment likely to open weak the second point was that w- what was the world going to do the entire world was going to sit and say we will all do a meltdown of all our global assets in every single asset class irrespective of everything else just because every few minutes there's going to be an announcement out of russia thirdly the russian currency was not showing this uh, the same tra- trends neither was the oil showing the same trend although oil was up only 2 odd percent last night but it was not showing the sort of catastrophe neither was the uh, crypto market which is very very jittery uh, in cert- certain circumstances and you've just known that last month there was a sort of a off and on with russia first saying we'll ban cryptocurrency then saying we were not going to ban even that was not showing so much of uh, you know so jitters so i had to calm people and say as you know I, it's not for me to say what the market level is i mean i wish i knew uh, but reality is i don't but i came and told them you really have to do nothing if you have the money and the market gives you an opportunity in the morning you can buy whatever pre decided scripts do not even carry do not come to the market and say okay i did not know what i'm going to buy but just because i saw the screen i'm going to just jump into a few names because they've fallen their fall could be justified but when you pre decide you don't suffer from a bias because you're not trying to subject your brain to uh, assessment of you know pre decided facts it's not like i've decided that the guy working next to me is not good so now next morning when i see his draft i'm going to find uh, if in a in a matter that he's doing i'm going to find mistakes only but when i look at it in a more objective way and i find that some of the companies that are attuned to my long term thinking or attuned to uh, an objective that i have in my mind are getting cheaper they and if i don't if i have the money then i'll buy them if i don't have the money i will buy small tokens or i will shift my portfolios uh, for example there are certain small caps where you will find that a lot of announcements are being made on qip i don't think that's a good sign in this market if at this point of time these small caps and they haven't fallen i mean relative to the market where are the giants are following you do not have a situation where the leaders collapse or are correcting and these uh, smaller companies who, who are otherwise not you know they don't have a sustainable sort of history and all of a sudden they are wanting to dilute capital you know there's something wrong so if you uh, as an example happen to own a company that where the longevity is is at doubt this is a good time to use your currency to get into much more stable managements which got which have leaders who are know what volatility is they will know what to do with russia as an example suppose a company let's i'm just again giving an example again it's not a recommendation suppose a pharma company's exposure to russia is 2% it's much more easier for that pharma company to tackle 2% than a company who says you know 55% of my sale is to the csir region so you have to at that point of time say that if if the csr a company for example a company with 50% exposure to csir falls 50% then what are you going to do anyways you already sort of knocked off because then after some point of time you're not going to expect that there is going to be no trade with russia for the rest of your life so it's a very objective call a very sorry a very subjective call that you have to take uh, but you have to keep objectivity in your mind so at the end of it if you have in i do not know what returns people have made but i am assuming that in the last 2 years they would have made at least tri- more than triple digit returns and out of that they would have knocked off maybe another maybe if, i do not know maybe 20% of their uh, gains which is fine uh, don't forget from where you were where you've got and don't forget where you are you're going to be measured from today so if you find value today it the value is going to give yields to you know tomorrow or day after or you know few months line don't go by looking at the past prices i mean for example some of my own stocks and i'm talking about my own portfolio some of my own stocks uh, maybe in the last few months were at uh, very exaggerated prices i may have enjoyed it but did i believe that i was going to buy them at that price no 
why did i not sell because i'm not sure at what what level of growth they're going to come in so i'll have to give it a sort of a balance effect and to that extent you know you don't and you know it's it's a very interesting thing and this is very important from my perspective to clarify to you every time i'm accused that when i come to interviews particularly on television or i come to chats which is a new phenomenon they say but you're always bullish but have you noticed that i was not bullish for the last few days which is not to say that i was selling my portfolio i said i the reason why i said i'm not bullish is because i said i'm uncertain with what is happening around the world i am confused between what the fed is doing in terms of tightening i'm in, confused with inflation and i while rbi is doing a phenomenally good job that is not necessarily true about monetary banks outside india i'm confused about the fact that the retail has seen the market do very well for two years and therefore has religiously pumped in money but i do not know whether they will be able to do that when the market sees downtrend for example this fall that has happened will they behave in a in a same way and go to all the good funds and the pms managers and continue to deploy money or will they get so psyched out by this the, the fall that they'll come and say now all sudden the equity has become a bad word and we're not going to impose give you money so what will the fund managers do the fund managers find it interesting to buy stocks when you don't give them money and when they find that the market is becoming overvalued you keep pumping money and then they have to deploy it because they don't know what to do with the money is sort of gushing in so uh, the behavior of people is not something that i know of so i said i will take a pause and therefore contrary to what i normally tweet i've said i've not been saying that in the last few days that i've been deploying fresh money but it appears to me from the market the way it is positioned and the way it is uh, some of the good companies have corrected that it may be time to start nibbling a little bit back onto some of the some of these names now i'll pause here and let uh, you know people other people participate uh safir uh, bef- before uh, before we sort of welcome in other people to ask questions uh i i just wanted to uh, you know uh, ask you two questions for the audience uh, to understand this concept better because what you've pointed out is actually of uh, of a lot of importance um which is around the 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 margins essentially uh when you spoke about companies that that have uh, had raw material pressures and have other kinds of pricing pressures going on their margins have been artificially depressed and uh, there are certain companies um, that you spoke about that have got you know uh, uh, that their margins have been elevated or they've been pushed even slightly beyond peak because of the uh, additional operational efficiencies that have come from covid so for you know somebody who's relatively newer in the market how do they get a sense of uh, where the uh, the company that they are looking at is in terms of uh, margins besides just you know observing historical margins yes yeah, so it's as an example there there are many ways so one of the ways uh, it, you know i i was giving this i was having this discussion last night and pe- some people said but you know uh, steel will be in a continuous uptrend or for example non ferrous or uh, aluminum will be a continuous uptrend my point is if the raw material prices and similarly you know what is happening with fuel currently you know what is happening with power cost etc if the raw material prices continue to remain high basic economics tells you that the viability of many people to do business will will be impaired it's not as if if a i'm in a very simple word it's not as if if i go to the market and the cost of food keeps going up i will continue to to uh, to you know sort of uh, uh, consume that food then people start looking at alternatives some people will, as an example if my earning power is impacted for whatever reasons when covid hit and the world had locked down you were not at that point of time gallivanting and seeing that no no next no matter what i'm going to have the most expensive food in the in the town just because of anything else it's only when some level of certainty sets in and you feel that no the survival instincts are not being threatened then you will come and say okay i can afford a little bit of indulgence similarly businesses when they find that this going on the raw material side is something which is of a temporary phenomenon only then they will do capacity expansions because then they will find that the future profitability will be better 
then you again go back to economics then the that, that economy is a skill set in because then if you find that the capacity is going to increase you will be able to bring in a lot of efficiencies by production in other forms and you you'll also try to minimize your wastages around distribution logistics sometimes you will find alternate resources because if 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 something is not so there is always a self adjustment mechanism that happens in the market the, in at least on the production side or on the part of the companies there is always a level of innovation that people do don't forget for example see to, when we look at banking look at the amount of innovation that is happening on the technology side of banking that technology side of banking is reducing the cost of transaction for the banks today the cost of acquisition of clients is impacted just before that you've had a time when the banks had adapted to atms you know which became a complete transformation just before that you had a concept of casa and the, everything became current account and saving account so the transformation of is is real and it happens across companies also if the world is truly to move into e vehicles now whether that happens in 2025 2030 xyz if the world is truly to get into newer forms of uh, of uh, transportation newer forms of logistics newer forms of uh, sustainable foods uh, uh, bio uh, degradable uh, products etc then each each one of these is a transformation similarly in the it industry if there's going to be a transformation into cloud which according to me is a colossal uh, opportunity that somebody is going to be enriched by the system now when somebody in an economy is enriched by a system he is an end he's a he's a he's a he's a means to several other people because it is a sort of a rub off effect for example he may pay more salaries the people that work in those companies they, because they get more salaries turn consumers whether they buy housing or they buy it, uh, you know big have wealth management services or xyz it's all sort of a link up so therefore to believe that is going to be a one way traffic where the metals will do well and the whole world other industries will not do well is a is a wrongful uh, belief the second side is if the metal price is correct then some of these companies will find that the raw material prices have sort of reduced and they will somewhat be able to pass it on to people because they want to really bring in volume growth that itself uh, means that I- either ways if you cannot be betting by saying that no metal prices will go up and the rest of the uh, industries will suffer or that the metal prices will correct and uh, uh, so much significantly and therefore we will not need to buy these things in order to make our ports dams airports roads uh, 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 defense and so many other things so it's just the logic of doing this and therefore you should because it requires a balance you should not tilt too much towards one side Uh, and defy certain other companies that have historically shown you how they create wealth so somebody for example if i was an entrepreneur of a company and i otherwise had a very credible board and i had very good advisors if i find that the problems today are on the logistic side i will reinvent the logistic side if i find that the problems are on the material side i will reinvent uh, including by sustainable uh, or recyclable ma- ma- material if i find that the problems are lying on the consumption side then i will innovate uh, either in terms of funding or reducing the cost of capital or coming out with some sort of incentives in order to galvanize or to uh, sort of augment the uh, thing so because those managements have been able to do it over a period of time today you are actually getting a discount on their ability to do that action and that discount is only something that's happened in 2 months i can understand if there was a continuous disruption of their business models and you say the d- decline has happened over 5 years because they're getting destroyed but in reality some of this correction has just happened because a a class of con- people looked at quarterly results which were flashing for example on television newspapers or on social media etc and they said you know what operating profit margin is 18 versus market expectation of 20 but the market expectation of 20 if it had come in the stock would have not corrected no and now it's not as if this is going to be a continuous deterioration because if it is then that management is not competent they shouldn't have been in the leadership position after all many of these people are leading their respective sectors so that is a clear opportunity according to me and that is why the market over a period of time reverts to mean because a lot of these inefficiencies will move towards efficiencies a lot of efficiencies will start moving into stagnation some of the efficiencies will move into inefficiencies fantastic point safir um guys please like take advantage of of all of this insight that's coming out here today 
um, listen to the recording later on. Uh, look at these three categories. Look at your own portfolios. Reflect on it. And then only will you be able to truly benefit from the kind of uh, wisdom that's being dropped here. Uh, Karan, you had a question or something to share? So I think I was uh, just listening to the question and what Safir had to say. So, you know, uh, looking at historical margins and uh, what has happened in the last two years, uh, see, there are multiple factors at play here. One is uh, businesses of a certain size, and I'm not talking about listed companies, but uh, say the SME sector, they were fairly large participants in uh, many categories in the market because of capitalization issues, headwinds, because of uh, frequent lockdowns and everything else. A lot of this business has also, you know, steadily been creeping up into the formalized sector. So a lot of the expansion in business that is occurring is actually a shift in market share from this large amorphous mass of companies to the large listed players in each segment. Now that, you know, that shift has taken place and let's assume more than half of it is going to stay with these companies. Now you'll get to see that, okay, if three or four companies in a certain sector have already gained, from here we will start seeing the next stage where the ones that are really good at executing and executing at scale, they will start showing a marked difference over a period of time. Secondly, uh, you know, uh, whatever is occurring in the last 30 to 50 to 60 days since this year has started, it's a remarkably different narrative and the market is reacting to the narrative and certain stocks which were overheated because of the narrative before 31st of December, they are now basically just reacting to the change in the narrative itself. The underlying performance, we will only get to see, you know, most uh, quarterly results are done now. So, you know, when April comes, that is when we really start seeing who is doing what and uh, what is it changing. So unless, you know, there are a set of companies that were exporting something to Russia or importing something from there and the underlying uh, commodity prices for those products go in a certain way, it is not, uh, you know, realistic for us to look at each individual stock and say 90% of the market declining today means 90% of the market was overvalued. And those of us who are buying, you know, we are simply not in this game today to buy because, uh, you know, it has corrected X percentage. But because we believe that there is a gap between what the intrinsic value of the business is and what the market values it at today. And I think that is the, you know, lens through which we should look at. What are these moats that are developed? Are they durable enough? And do we see them continuing the next year, the year after that? This month, we will look back at it like people who've been in the market for long look at all the other, uh, you know, things that have happened, uh, which have been defined as, you know, the market went down by X, Y, and Z. Yeah, you know, one point that I wanted to add to uh, what Karan just said, uh, and I uh, totally agree with his uh, with his thought process, uh, is that, you know, uh, uh, as a practitioner whose job is only to help companies create modes, that is my, my profession itself, being in, in intellectual property enables companies to create modes. Let me tell you, one of the modes that nobody talks about, even the study, and I had, in fact, at one point of time, written to Mr. Ramdev Agarwal also saying that after so much of, uh, work that you've done on wealth creation studies, which is fantastic. Uh, one mode that nobody talks about is the resilience of a company to adapt to change. That itself is is a very big catalyst because every mode is not an identified mode that exists in front of you. Certain, you know, look at anybody. If you look at a business model, look at, for example, the broking houses today. If the broking houses have been able to adapt to a model where they're taking on somebody who's giving a zero brokerage, and yet they're able to transform because of either the digital onset or because of the varied level of services that they have done or because of the way they're managing money or the way they're managing risk. That itself is an evolution and process. Now, if you start looking at certain companies' ability to withstand uh, a lot of the winds when they arrive and are able to adapt what, called, what Darwin called as the actual survival of the fittest, he said you don't have to be the strongest, you have to be the one who adapts the most. 
uh, that adaptability itself gives a lot of opportunities and when you read about companies adapting uh, in that process because of the onset of several factors like the ones i'm talking and at the same time the market is at is at a situation where it is not able to appreciate initially uh, the efforts that are going into that adaptation it is usually a sign that over a period of time you you have a very good chance of doing well in those companies absolutely safir i think it's it's super important to to figure out um these uh, uh these modes that exist in 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 hidden spaces and and dealing with adversity is absolutely you know one of the uh the competitive advantages that doesn't get spoken about and another one that uh, for me personally you know uh, works uh, or has been a source of uh, a tremendous gain has been the speed and efficiency at which the company works the company might have you know a similar business model uh, than what the guy next to him has but if he has figured out a way uh, to execute faster and um, uh, like you know how asian paints had been able to do with with their logistics model it might, the the moat might not even be uh, in the uh, in the product itself but maybe in the delivery of the product or in the production of the product or in the sourcing of the product or in the supply chain and i think these sort of modes t- tend to get ignored uh, far more often than the more visible modes um, like the ones that are spoken about with uh, with something like a nestle which is a regulatory mode which is m- much more visible for people to see and figure out and um, yeah it's it's really really important to to look for uh more intangible and more invisible modes in order to be able to refine one's investing practice with that let me uh, uh, welcome welcome manish uh, manish do you have something you want to say or you have a question for safir yeah i have one question like uh, to be just very optimistic is there any industry in india which is likely to benefit by you know a reduction in imports from ukraine or russia and similarly is there any industry which will benefit from rise in the crude oil price because their product might become cheaper comparative to the international prices see so uh, you know uh, i i don't have a necessarily uh, on the point answer to your question because it is a very recent uh, situation and i have not gone into the dichotomy of that situation on a Uh, industry to industry wide basis but the one point i want to make which is uh, a point for example that i would deliberate in my own mind is on one side we are talking about uh, or at least the auto majors are talking about a move towards e vehicles when i speak to some of the companies that are in the business of e vehicles i find that the uh, overall offtake particularly uh, at the there is a greater level of disruption that is happening on the e vehicle space when it comes to two wheelers right now as opposed to four wheelers because obviously they become logistic uh, instruments of logistics and therefore deliveries and other things two wheelers three wheelers uh, are adapting to a faster extent right now electric cycles are adapting to a faster extent on one side we are talking about the elimination of or the reduction of oil on the second side therefore by adapting either to a ev model or a hybrid model on the second side companies as big as maruti are talking about a cng model uh, and this phenomenon is not only a phenomenon in india it is happening all over the world so right now to take a call which is basically uh, just because of a temporary i at least think a temporary rise in crude it's not you know basic economics told you the difference between demand and supply and what price movements uh, do cause and right now when there's an industrial migration that is happening Uh, to basically take a call that how the rise in crude would benefit somebody or uh, uh, impair somebody is in a slightly difficult call and in between this you can throw in green energy and you can throw in the uh, you know the environmental sustainability theme and many other things and it becomes even more complex now look at the other side of it also which is like i'm just playing the devil's advocate if there are sanctions that are imposed on russia which us has said that they are going to impose sanctions in reality how much of the sanction has been imposed between us and china let's first evaluate that because the moment us says that i'm going to i'm only going back in time and you know what happened when covid hit and china problems were coming on many uh, you know every day us and china were having a battle and they will say we will not allow your companies we'll delist from us they will not allow xyz etc now china has started fighting its own 
companies look what they are doing to alibaba and what they did to the edtech sector etc etc so it is too complex a uh, variable to think like this because if america as an example imposes sanctions on russia and russia comes to india and says i want to become a buyer of your services then overnight the uh, dynamics of our companies can be changed Uh, similarly for example uh, you know just uh, one or two days before that is before this uh, india gave a warning and asked uh, its people to you know move from ukraine india actually had announced higher number of flights uh, air india had announced higher number of flights to ukraine which was also sort of not making sense at this point of time what they what were they attempting to do were they talking about evacuation or were they talking about an opportunity or something now historically businesses tell you that when there's adversity somebody is going to knock the opportunity and sort of in you know capture it so it's very difficult for me at least as an individual to take a call on whether this will benefit whether somebody will become because russia can become can create demand for anybody and right and one of the biggest problems of investing in companies for example in the rice sector Uh, which where i've repeatedly looked at companies is that every now and then iran will do something and we'll say oh now it's impacted then the middle east will stop buying because something has gone wrong with the infrastructure development there it is very very complex to sort of have a precise answer and even if it is there it will be a very short term move which will not even last more than a quarter of that company's earning because it cannot be that russia will remain in darkness and the world will accept that and will live on with it they will also do their own stuff so i at least don't have the competence to answer that question beyond the explanation that i've given thanks safir i think uh, that that's more of an understanding than anyone can kind of hope for in this moment and it's also very important uh, uh, to pay attention to what you pointed out which is the fact that uh, you know allocation based on temporary gyrations in the market doesn't make a lot of uh, sense when it comes to the long term um uh, we also have dr tanmay here who also hosts a bunch of investing rooms so uh, hi dr tanmay do you have something you want to share about the current market situation or do you have a question for safir sir I, i guess he is uh, he's he's unable to speak right now uh, anyway uh, uh safir uh, when we when we look at uh, you know um these three different sections of the portfolio that you spoke about uh defensives the players that have been hammered and the third kind uh how would you look at uh, allocation between these three uh, you know uh between these th- three groups of companies yes so see like, the, the uh, all- allocation is a flexible rubber band when i say it's a flexible rubber band it depends upon somebody has the appetite for growth somebody has the appetite for uh, risk somebody cannot see volatility somebody will come and say for example today if the market was down say on the mid at least on the mid cap and the uh, uh, small caps by about 2% but a lot of people on the large caps would have not seen similar erosions in the portfolios because you, the large cap index was relatively very stable so the question is, is still what has happened today is not going to decide your returns tomorrow just as an example and i i will i'm just trying to explain to you i have to be tomorrow on et now at 9 o'clock in the morning 9:15 in the morning the morning situation may be very different from what we are talking about vis-a-vis all these geopolitical factors and how the markets react and all that to take a call so let's assume in the morning for some reason the mid cap index is up 1 and 1/2% now all of a sudden will i feel victorious because in a in effect human beings react like that in the morning if we find that our portfolios are up 1 1.5% at least on the mid cap and small cap side we will always start believing that the recovery has set in that's it's always happened like this and when the market and that is why in the morning if the if you saw the market down 1200 points and it recovered to even 300 points on the bsc irrespective of whether your portfolio recovered or not you would feel that no you are steadily coming out of a pain that's how human psychology is so how you are going to position your portfolio the reason why your first important thing is to understand why are you doing this you are doing this because you are want to tide over uncertainty it is only when you are it's it's like this only if you live longer then you are able to compound more no so t- typically if your portfolio lives longer and it doesn't get rogered in this market falls then you have the ability to sort of you know do more adventurous things and more daring things when the market comes your way 
so that is the reason why you are reclassifying it so i don't want a situation like for example uh, uh, when i did this survey on twitter uh, a few days back a lot of people that time 37% but now i believe the number will be even higher had already said that their portfolio had been ero- eroded more than 20% today that 20 could have become 30% now that's a lot of capital gone if your capital base uh, was small or for example it was a source of a lot of things that you desire to do in life it is and also mathematically you know how difficult it is to recoup that 30% because unfortunately the fall of 30% doesn't mean that the recoup of 30% is going to you know do justice to you so that is why you're positioning your portfolio in a situation where you do not understand putin you do not understand biden you do not know what is happening i do not know what is going to be the outcome of up elections vis-a-vis the market i do not know what lic will ipo will do because of the impact that has happened in the market will it sail through see don't forget success for the government could be the uh, uh, lic ipo sailing through but for an investor he wants to see how much money he makes because that's why he's investing in an ipo uh, similarly for example somebody says i had surplus money as an institution and i have deployed it for example in lic and therefore i have no other money to buy the market itself is uh, another sort of uh, impediment so that is why you're positioning your portfolio because there are too many variables you still don't know what the fed is doing the uh, while people keep talking about interest rates they actually ignore the fact that the interest rate rise hike has already has usually goes with the increase in the market rather than the fall in the market but the most smart people despite having the facts of this from all the historical uh, uh, evidence are still coming and debating every single day how many interest hikes will be i mean why are you even discussing whether there'll be eight or nine first start with one see the second see where the world growth is see where how stable the world is but we are just jumping to so many conclusions because there are variables because people can be irrational for example today itself there are certain stocks that may have fallen 6 to 7 or 8 to 9% in today's market that had nothing to do with russia so all of a sudden why were they falling today because somebody has incurred a loss somewhere else and he's trying to knock off his portfolio or maybe there's a lack of buyers or maybe the institutions are focusing on some other thing etc etc that is why you are creating a, a sort of a widespread portfolio you're creating it in order to ensure that when the market does well you reap the benefit of the uprise and if the market was to stagnate you will be able to get some amount slightly more than the market and if the market was to crack you would not go down 25 or 30% like some people have gone down what if all your portfolio was in new tech companies as an example would you'll be sitting with 60% losses today and mind you some of these new tech companies even after their listing when the prices had not corrected to this extent were being touted as very disruptive and very far, innovative and very fast growing but that's not played out that way because it go it is inevitable that this happens repeatedly and you know do you realize that in this market correction i am just giving an example why is real estate stocks fallen so badly is it like once after one day you just last week read xyz builder has has launched so many apartments in bombay and they got sold within 48 hours and so and so get launched this and it sold but then all of a sudden have tumbled because somebody's losses will sponsor something else so you have to be prepared because you cannot control the what they call you cannot control the irrationality of crowds you can only control the fact that you that you have to do survive first survive then be have the ability to thrive when the market gives you an opportunity absolutely i i think there's a there's a lot of uh, you know um insight there that's come from a lot of experience and when we look at things you know step by step and see how they evolve we we uh, you know uh, develop the ability to respond to a constantly changing environment which is what the market really is uh, dr tanmay are you able to speak now yeah yeah i think i'm audible now yeah 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 i i got scared i thought you were preparing <laughs> anesthesia here to give me no no <laughs> so uh, i i do have two cases at night you know i wait kar rahe the and i just joined in to listen to you it's always a delight you know listen, listening to you and thanks krishna for having me over so uh, w- you want me to add on the current scenario or what yeah uh, current scenario or if you have a question for safir uh, i i think we did discuss you know uh, we had a really good space i think uh, a few days back with safir so i don't have questions maybe 
जस्ट से कि मतलब अगर माइक्रोस्कोप से देखोगे ना मार्केट को तो बहुत ज्यादा मूवमेंट्स लगते हैं बहुत सारे रीजन मिलने वाले हैं यू नो फ्यू डेज बैक द नरेटिव वाज दैट कोल खत्म होने वाला है दैट वाज द पैनिक सिचुएशन देन इंटरेस्ट रेट्स की बात चल रही थी जहां पे पीपल वर सेइंग दैट द फेड में इंक्रीज द इंटरेस्ट रेट्स द लिक्विडिटी में वैनिश आउट एंड डिफरेंट काइंड्स ऑफ नैरेटिव्स देन यू दिस रशिया यूक्रेन हैज कम अप सो डिफरेंट सॉर्ट ऑफ नैरेटिव्स विल कीप कमिंग इन बट देन आई थिंक Uh, uh, for a retail investor the person who is invest like who is actually owning a bunch of stocks he actually needs to worry if their quarter on quarter earnings are getting uh, affected or there is some actual change in the fundamentals of the company that we are holding otherwise why need to you know uh, look at the market every single day and panic ki our price 5% niche ho gaya ya 10% niche ho gaya although uh, if if some stock that you have been like holding for a long time and you are like couldn't find the opportunity to add in the number of the numbers that you wanted or your allocations goal is not yet met then probably it is an uh, rather an opportunity to buy on such kind of stocks and just you know keep adding those at a fair kind of valuations often there are lots and lots of stocks who that will never come to the fair value or something like that they'll always trade at premium but in such kind of panic wherein the people who uh, who take out the money will you know there is a very famous saying where it, it says that during at the the time of crash the stock returns to its original owner who is there so i think the one who is patient enough the one who has been following the company for a long time whichever company you are owning and if you if you believe that the uh, earnings uh, you see earnings growth visibility that is there free cash is going to go then i don't think th- such kind of incidences should worry us a lot uh, you know safir had uh, put up a tweet today and i had i did also comment on that he was saying how he, he uh, you know takes uh, um, confidence from the calls that he has taken previously in such kind of incidences and that gives him the confidence to go on even i also started doing this habit a few years back wherein i used to write if i wanted to buy a stock then why would i want it what are the valuations that uh, you know suited to buy that stock at that particular time or if i am selling some then why am i selling it uh, i used to maintain a diary of that and every now and then you know a year later or two years later or three years later i look at that uh, finance diary which i maintain in the, there in i see if if you know the growth prospect was there at that time the story which i believed in and then purchase that stock at that time if it if it is still there then why to worry it at all and if the stock price you know if the decision that you had taken at that time has given you really good returns then you do gain a good amount of confidence from it and another thing that i also do is if even if i don't take a buy or a sell sell call or something even if i skip a stock okay if if there was some reason why i didn't buy a stock at particular valuation or because of the fundamentals that i did not like then probably i would skip it and i would write it there and i will see a stock in two year or three years time and then probably i would still learn from it so i would take it more as a learning thing the more time we spend in the more analysis we do we keep on growing over a period of time uh, and always it's it's a pleasure you know listening to uh, uh, the veterans who are there who have been there in the markets for long time to learn from their experiences as well so we need not do the set of mistakes that they have done or if they are sharing it out uh, loud in the public then we can just listen to them and keep on tracking that if we are not uh, doing the same set of mistakes that are there and uh, the guidance also really helps a lot so i don't believe ki uh, matlab uh, you know when covid came in everyone was saying that probably the world will end uh, human race won't be able to combat this and look at us uh, now we are most lots of people are going out there in the public without mask also they are not fearing anything covid has become like we recently encountered the third wave which was mild and people did combat that as well and now we are confident that okay we are probably out of covid crisis which was once seen as a uh, situation of doom where in everything would fail and the markets crash like anything so i think um, mankind is really powerful um there are different set of challenges that have come in the narratives keep on changing markets crash hote rahenge upar niche but then eventually we will overcome those kind of struggles that are there and uh, if if we have a long term perspective then i i don't think there is a reason to worry much about it uh, over to you krishna thanks and my bef- before i comment and uh, take this conversation forward i just want to also uh, let vivek ask his question cuz he's been waiting for a while and then i'll chime in after vivek Vivek are you ready to speak? Yes, thank you. 
Yeah, I was just uh, trying to unmute myself. Firstly, it is quite astonishing that uh, we have a forum on a day when there is a, a big tumble in the market, and from uh, from the voice, uh, you know, obviously we are also picking up cues as you speak, right? The amount of confidence that is flowing from Safir Ji is uh, is quite uh, what do you call it? Is quite refreshing because uh, you know those who are in the market know what the pain is uh, for for the participants so my question to uh, you know safir is uh, you know uh, to the extent that you're comfortable can you speak about how your own portfolio i mean you don't have to probably even name names but how has your portfolio kind of reacted to um, you know this unfolding uh, almost chaos and catastrophe because you know he, he's got a parliament not to take military action and the us cons considers this already considers this as an invasion so i'm sure putin will follow through and there will be a big uh, uh, there will be a big reaction in the market because every country almost would be affected so if you can speak about how your investment philosophy is the, the whole idea is for us to pick some uh, ideas and refine ourselves because some of us are suffering right and so we want to get better at this how has your portfolio withstood it and if uh, and what is the thought process behind building the portfolio uh, which also has to face these kinds of situations thank you see uh, uh, while you are uh, talking in context of uh, what you are calling as an inevitable russian invasion and the implications of all that let's not uh, lose sight of the fact that the world markets that is not to do with india but the world markets which are way more advanced and which 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 also have very sizable players are already uh, uh, right now uh, open and running so what is the rational of for example a futsi being in the green right now with the news that is already flowing from russia as if they are not tuned in what is the rational of now don't if you look at dow and say it is down 200 or 250 odd point when i last saw it don't forget that dow was shut on monday dow has dow is reacting to two days by following not even 1% so or whatever x percent and nasdaq and which has been very volatile uh, and where the companies derive businesses a lot from uh, europe and therefore would be impacted by any disturbance in europe is behaving in a very rational and normal way right now as if it was a normal market day this correction that the us is seeing right now or the green that some parts of europe are seeing is a very rational move so why is it that all of a sudden this is going to be an inevitable result only on india to begin with because more advanced brains with billions and billions of dollars and very large impact on the market when we're, we're buying and selling and really mess up the market moves are not reacting in the same way right now first point second point is that you know russia is also don't you know i'm i'm not a political uh, expert and i'm not uh, good at i don't want to talk about things that i'm not good at but according to me i do understand negotiations because as a lawyer and as a successful lawyer i know what negotiations are about russia has even now told ukraine look my troops have entered i'm giving you last opportunity and ukraine has replied back saying we're not scared just see the commentary just a few minutes back why are you even making i mean you do two people do two people fight in this way that one comes into your house and says look i've come into your house now i'm going to kill you the second guy goes and stands in front of him and says no look i'm standing in front of you i want to see how you kill then they are still talking that is the essence of that is how it is happening and then america and germany and others are saying look we are going to impose sanctions on you then germany is saying i will not announce the sanctions right now because i don't want you to be prepared so i will uh, do, uh, announce the sanctions after some days and america is telling them we are look we are going to do this right now and then i'm not going to meet you biden is telling him now i'm not going to meet you see these developments are it's like there is a there are pressures that are trying to be imposed because inevitably either side whether it is us or it is russia or it is ukraine or it is uk or it is france or it is germany either side everybody is trying to measure where the solution will come from i don't think i mean at the end of the day suppose for whatever reason let's go to an extreme that there is a war and that war becomes really bloody messy uh, economically destroying etc what anyways what are you going to do with your portfolio you you should be then bothered about your business first 
you should be bothered about law and order situation in the world you should be bothered about whether it becomes a world war x y z then it's not but this has not happened in today's world the economic interest is so high interest is so many countries that it has not happened we are not talking about the past even today people condemn right from pearl harbor to hiroshima etc is all condemned in history so uh, so see so, i not- no i i like uh, you know the way you've logically dissected it uh, but um, you know as investors we need to have a sense and where i'm coming from is really uh, the aspect of margin of safety what are we doing with our portfolios and that's what i want to glean from you is what are we doing with our portfolios that will help us ride through even these kinds of storms so if you can help with those inputs on how a portfolio construction can happen even taking uh, into account doomsday scenarios you know actually see the concept of margin of safety according to me is a very uh, misnomer the, the the margin of safety is higher today than it was a few days back because in an inevitable correction that the market has done it has it has it has take it takes out excesses it takes out exuberance it starts taking taking out for example wherever there were pockets of madness uh it will take out a lot of premiums in from the ipos it will take out a lot of uh, crazy valuations that are happening on the private equity side i meet private equity companies they come and tell me to put money i say what is your valuation they say 10 crores they meet me after 3 months they say 50 crores i said which order did you get they said nothing which is round 2 as if if round 1 to round 2 you went to school you went to class 1 you went to class 2 in class 2 you said because i've reached class 2 two, today i should be qualified to class 10 just because i came first in my class or i came in whatever x y z reason so there's a irrationality in the market that irrational now see why is the world market why are the metals not collapsing in a situation which is which is believed to be so catastrophic in the world right now why are the metals not collapsing why is the oil not collapsing if the world is going to shut off some part of the economy so right now they are just it's it's an equilibrium that is happening that equilibrium is is being characterized by extreme volatility volatility is a friend of the investor the risk profile is improved because i'll tell you something and i'm being very candid with you in january if i was sitting and i was making in january i had surplus for some surplus funds also because i had done some amount of selling also in the market in december i couldn't identify stocks to buy i was forcing myself it was literally like i was holding a magnifying glass and forcing myself today without without anything if i right now switch on suppose i open the bhav copy i go to nsc bsc or download the bhav copy why will i download the bhav copy because it's not as if i've got a fixated mind that i have to only buy xyz that is one view of investing but the, i see the bhav copy and i look at certain scripts and say are how how is it possible that this guy has fallen so much he is not at all worth this fall he is way he is he deserves more and the question that i'm going to tell myself is that i have money for example in my bank that money in my bank as of 31st december 2022 will probably earn me 4 4 1/2% interest if i have to beat that 4 4.5% interest and i find that my stock can give me a 15 to 20% return i will do four times or three and a half times better than what the bank will give me today if when i look at the screen today means after the market is closed there are lot of stocks that i feel that i will be able to make this 15 to 20% return in between they may fall another 10% and i'm saying a 15 to 20% return from the current prices if they fall 10% more and if i have the ability to buy them more i'll probably make better returns similarly i look at my portfolio and if i find that there are pockets of exuberance where i as a uh, as somebody who should have been more rational and should have been more practical have not been able to uh, in cash because i got carried away then i will adjust to some extent similarly for example if i have a company that i was that is expected to grow at say Uh, 10 to 12 percent per annum. And I'm not talking about a stock price growth. I'm talking about business growth. Whereas I find that a bigger leader of a higher magnitude or with a better uh, sort of uh, uh, you know financial acumen or better market acumen is also corrected to the same extent. Then I would switch the currency. I will say I will rather hold a more stable and growth oriented stock than something which is going to be more volatile. This is very helpful, Sachin. Ji, one uh, final concluding point. is what number of uh, stocks typically on average you hold in your portfolio 
and so uh, this question everybody asks me but i i'll, I'll tell you I, 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 the reason why because you are able to uh, go to cash that is why i'm asking this question because you I churn go, no i don't go to cash you don't go to cash no no i don't go to cash because if my, if i find that the going is wrong with the company which can happen going can be wrong for multiple reasons one is that you made a bad choice about a stock for example you ended up buying say yes bank and you made a bad choice because things have gone wrong or you bought a company and certain governance issues have crept in in the company and that is sort of worrying you or you have bought a company and the company has not done a governance issue but the management is very confused and is trying to work too hard and is diversifying unnecessarily into product lines that may not be a good allocation of capital then you will revisit those like for example why did i exit the insurance company then i made it public because they were it was not firstly the the insurance company was overvalued commensurate to growth secondly when i went and asked people during the covid time they said no we are not going to be taking insurance so i said why are you not going to take insurance they had a very different logic they said we have lost two years of our life by being home by being confined by being denied travel by being denied uh, the ability to meet friends watch movies etc etc so our priorities in life for the for the loss of two years considering that human life is limited have changed then people said that i had insurance but i made a claim but they said it's not covered under covid so our foundations about the the faith of the insurance company has been impacted then some of the insurance company said that wherever we were forced to give force means whatever by our contract we were required to give insurance claims we have therefore suffered uh, this and now we are increasing the insurance premium so they did not realize that in some cases there was a contraction of the of the demand because of earning or because of uncertainty or because of job layoff or because of any level of disruption now don't forget if somebody is a uh, self uh, is an uh, entrepreneur or a, a sort of self employed person he doesn't have the same luxury that he will get his salary because somebody else has gone to office and working now so there there was self adjustment mechanism now what has happened is that when you looked at that and you looked at another onset of an lic which was at that point also inevitable you knew that a big daddy of an ipo in the sector is coming and you know the fact that by historical reasons the government divestment always happens at a sort of a discount even now lic has announced that you will get a discount if you're an lic policy holder so when you come and say a large player in the industry's price to earning or lies large player's enterprise value is going to go at discount why should the others be at a premium right now so you have just applied your logic to it and as a consequence you know when i when i had written and i had exited as an example icic or lombard somebody had validly from his point of time come and told me but you have exited but you don't know what is going to happen this one year is bad but next year will be expired the stock is way below my selling level the money that you got from that has been utilized to buy something more efficient which is what i call as a currency swap with a v scripts and if you instead of losing 20% you probably made 40% so in a sense you have bettered your portfolio now if out of that return say 4% has been lost because something has happened last week or something else is it disturbing my equilibrium to realign the portfolio no it isn't thank you very much so just a uh, just a quick announcement before we move on uh, guys if if you are new to the space uh, please dm me your questions uh, we we use this mechanism to filter out any trolls um, and keep the conversation focused uh, next we have uh, nilesh shetty uh, nilesh you can unmute and ask your question to safir Nilesh, you're on mute. Yeah, Krishna. Thanks. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, so, Safir sir, basically, I, you know, I have been reading on this uh, th- uh, thesis that due to the rising inflation, this uh, FMCG companies, uh, the consumer staples will face margin pressure and they'll underperform uh, going ahead. So, just wanted to know how far this th- th- uh, thesis is correct. I mean, has there any cases pre- previously where uh, due to this rising inflation this companies had faced pre- pressures well of course rising inflation currently seems to be a bigger worry for fmcg but the worry from fmcg is coming from many counts 
one one it is coming from the raw material point which you are articulating but you know there is also a lot of migration happening in the business models for example many of them are having to adapt to digital that in digit uh, many of them are changing their way they advertise they used to have traditionally a very good reach because of advertising which is getting away because right now nobody wants to read newspapers and the holdings are not there people then is getting impacted by the lack of travel because uh, pe- when people travel they develop a particular zone then a new market develops uh, it is happening by a lot of good quality startups that are coming and because of new businesses or models like amazon flipkart etc that are making a lot of these products available for example if every single if you go to some of these blogs or some of these i like for example you go to instagram instagram is not promoting the products of these uh, companies that you're talking about but you will find that a lot of new varieties of noodles pasta this xyz products face creams uh, acne lotion so many products are coming and they are getting endorsements of end users because of the way the business structure is being done so what is going to happen is that there is one side of the market where the large companies will be able to innovate and you will see why unilever or companies of that sort have like for example even the colgate now they have come out with an oil pulling it's called i think some some product which is to do with oil pulling you know it's the vedic concept of putting oil in your mouth and gargling over a certain period of time which is very good for it is an antibacterial sort of a thing so when they will evolve like this uh, colgate as an example and i'm again not recommending it colgate right now has more than 200 300 products that it hasn't even launched in india so when these companies innovate with unilever has innovated look where they started off with uh, Uh, with uh, say for example where dove was and now dove has become a shampoo from a soap and how for example they have moved if you go into history and you see what some of their pure soaps used to be and what they are today uh, what they have done to lux and how they've got into from uh, a basic soap into a shower gel and now to a shower cream to a moisturizer etc they have evolved so when they evolve they are also able to move up the price points like britannia at one point of time was moving from basically like a tiger biscuit into cream based then into cakes but when you and then into croissants but when you find that the market is not receptive because the market gets a better choice for, for any reason i'm just not saying that in any then then you will have to reexamine and say that maybe these companies because see one of the problems with being a very good company and some of the consumer companies are fantastic companies fantastic companies are not necessarily the best investments is that they have squeezed both the top line and bottom line that means they have brought in all the they have removed all the inefficiencies into the system so they do not have any bottom line growth now they only need to have top line growth and they are already sitting with a very colossal market so for example if if a company is sitting with say 52% market it has to fight its own self it has to fight its own products which is way more difficult than somebody who's creating a market segment and anybody who's created a market segment if you go back in history and say okay somebody came out with a sachet shampoo and they created a market segment somebody said okay i'll take up coconut oil and i'll create a market segment those market segments then create a lot of or for example fairness creams or so many examples that you will find today that level of innovation is coming from too many quarters so i don't personally feel and the consumer companies sorry to say but at a, are at an extreme premium they look at the amount of gro- uh, premium that some of the indian subsidiaries of these companies have vis-a-vis their own parents where is the parent is going to bet on the growth coming from india only so if you if the growth comes from india and it goes back to the parent the parent is available at ridiculously low valuations in comparison to what the indian company is generating the indian company's valuation should have been premium if the growth was premium or if for example if the company is at a 25 to 30 p then you say yes historically also it's fine because they're very good allocators of capital now also see one very interesting things the consumer companies because they are such excellent allocators of capital are not able to put the capital to use because of because they do not find that if they put the capital to use i mean for example if the market is not receptive or the product is not receptive with needs so what are they doing they dole it back and give it to you because if they keep that money the money will not give them adequate returns so the cost of capital the 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 capital employed will fall that's why they dole out dividends and they'll say what 250% 300 400 600 700 now even some of the pharma giants are doing that if you look at it for example look at the kind of dividend that sanofi has announced in the last 3 4 years because maybe they don't they can't put the money to use 
but but that money is also finished na it's getting distributed either the cash flows are intact now if i as an example i keep reading about the comments that come in from the managing director of nestle india he himself is talking about a struggle and he is not available cheap so it's not that if i buy it i may not fall but my primary objective of investing is not to create a portfolio that doesn't fall my primary objective of of investing is to get capital appreciation within the capital appreciation i should not fall or if i fall which i it's not i'm not trying to shy away from the fact that we've all fallen then we should not get wiped off to an extent that we cannot come back into the market hope that answered your question nilesh yes krishna yes thank you oh, thank you sir sir thank you krishna for the opportunity most welcome uh, then then we have karan uh, karan and then chetan uh safir if you're looking at certain sectors from a 3 to 5 year horizon and not specific stocks but uh, maybe a basket or a sector per se uh, any thoughts there that you would like to share with us that you think are going to do better than the rest of the lot i personally believe the fact that while the market may be temporary in the moody phase and therefore in the moody phase it may have knocked out some of the it players the level of uh, business that lies ahead of them is huge i mean if if you if you actually look at it from m- many perspective there is a digital onset today the digital onset was led by new tech companies it was led by banks now even some of the traditional companies that may be making cement or maybe doing some you know uh, a toll booth or uh, uh, looking at the efficacy of uh, of a uh, of a commodity that they produce are trying to bring in technology and move into digital space even startups want digital mid companies want digital payrolls have to be digital uh, i the other day was part of a of a presentation made by a company i'm not going to name it they were mapping every single movement of a truck from one factory to another every single uh, shops uh, you know off take etc because they were putting erp to a best form so so the movement to digital the movement to cloud now look at the extent of movement that is going to happen in cloud then look at the extent of level opportunity that ha- that has to come in cars are no longer the cars that we used to drive when we were kids the cars today are nothing but gizmos they are they are beautiful uh, uh, you know it infrastructure it's like sitting in an it room it happens to go on the road it happens to do a lot of things right from the displays of the cars to the entire mechanisms to the way they control alternate uh, and you know the current flow and whether they move from petrol to hybrid hybrid to this the way the amount of motors that exist in the cars in order to make functionality there are huge opportunities that exist across the it spectrum and today everybody construes it to be an instrument in order to capture efficiency so by buying it companies you are capturing efficiencies you are capturing customers you are capturing uh, uh, lack of leakages or whatever xyz into your systems and therefore and that is an ongoing thing because it requires an annuity it requires a maintenance contract then it requires an upgrade so that it's a, and look at again look at the onset of social if today if even social platforms like an instagram or now say whatsapp business etc are going to become instruments of commerce again you have to go back to it so i think that the longevity of this sector right now is very very apt it's showing in the job market it is showing in Indi- and also you know what india has the skills we were always good in software and maths and we are given the opportunity and we are sort of stabilizing now the only small debate that you will have is what will this currency do x y z and my belief is that a lot of these industry players they have gone through a lot of uh, you know movements in currency they have there have been times when for example they have been knocked out because of currency movement etc they are relatively more prepared they know how they have to price there is a genuine demand read the commentaries from even the international players the extent of the demand that is being created we are tr- truly a globalized world and therefore it is this cross selling of these services happening all around the world we are in a collaborative model where two people may collaborate when it's not surprising tomorrow we infosys and wipro jointly collaborate and develop something there is a demand coming from from the government after all all this entire move that they're doing from aadhar to uh, upain to xyz every single transactional that i have to do in my life today i feel i am only doing it 
so but what is enabling me it is only getting enabled by technology so i believe and then it's an export story you know that's another uh, plus sign because we are made up we are making our industry more competitive and it becomes an export oriented story so the government wants to discourage imports which is understandable but it wants to encourage exports so when it wants to encourage exports again what will happen is even the entire even the debates on whether the foreign companies will set up say uh, say centers in india so the government comes up in the budget and says data centers will be given infra status that infra status if it is given to a foreign participant to come in india what stops infosys and tcs and wipro and hcl tech and tech mahindra and whatever names you want to add emphasis and uh, mastec and uh, mindtree ventry everybody from doing whatever they want to do why will they lose their edge so it's that according to me is a good sector the second sector that i really believe in and i've been investing is is the banking sector i personally believe and i at the risk of being wrong so far right but at the risk of being wrong i think that the fintechs that are coming into the equity market at exorbitant valuation then this i said even earlier on the eve of some of the ipos they are actually going to benefit the banks they will strengthen the banking system rather than weaken it they are only intermediaries and i feel that the banking system is coming out from a huge npms it is coming out from a low credit cycle it is coming out from lack of appreciation for because you didn't like the service of the bank the way the structure was etc but that is being replaced again by technology today it's at the push of a button now you can argue that the service of one bank vis-a-vis the app of another bank you know you don't like it one thing but in reality see you know what what those apps are doing look at the size of, size of that look at the ability to reach look at what the rbi is saying that in certain areas where internet connections are not available we will allow transactions up to 200 rupees to start with money to bank se aayega na ya bank mein jayega i mean i'm not saying you can you can put it in a wallet but even a wallet is will have a limited functionality at the end of the day what is the wallet going to do is at the you will again go back to the bank and say i need a loan i need to in, get an interest i want to make a fixed deposit i want to do a, a foreign remittance so many certain certain things will happen so they are pair to be and you know at, at, while we criticize the finance sector for a lot of valid reason including things like scams etc that have happened don't forget the largest institutions in the world right from you look at america and look at the financial giants that they have created look at the size of those financial giant vis-a-vis our, our our own situation situation here today so that then the betterment of the medical facilities and i think dr tanmay will be able to elaborate more on this we in in india do not have the kind of medical facilities because simply we were not creating an opportunity for the entrepreneur to create it it did not matter like for example when i was a child i could have gone to my local colony doctor and said bukhar hai and you would have taken the thermometer and put it in my mouth and taken out a stethoscope and done something and written for some for two of medicine and i have gone and taken that and fine today i am not in that mode today there is dedicated technology we have done a lot of brain drain and some of the best doctors in the world have come from india they because they didn't find the need to be in india now some of them are coming back into india and they're setting up somebody setting up a cancer hospital somebody is doing a, a brain uh, uh, thing some things you know so mri is come up in a big way technology is uh, uh, enabling a lot of things people will move on they will find the reason to do this now where the affordability is a problem they will do it remotely they will say okay we will we will out we will break the entire treatment into parts you can go to a cheaper diagnostic center you can have an access to a high end uh, uh, doctor by virtue of a remote call that you can make that is you take an online appointment or you have a sort of a dedicated thing your reports can be stored electronically on a vault which a lot of these hospitals and all are creating now for example if i go for a check up my doctor already has access to the reports he's got a all he has to do is to generate an otp and then he gets access to my reports i don't have to carry all my files etc if i was to go for a check a general check up etc e pharmacies are coming pharmacies are getting much more organized counterfeiting of drugs if it is addressed in india it's going to be the biggest growth factor i don't think that in perpetuity nobody is going to do anything about it see look at our medicines you go to america you buy a medicine look at the kind of safety locks it has 
you look at the level of prescription india has not reached that stage because the zarurat nahi thi we cut our medicine hum ek goli de dete hain we are the only country that cuts a patta and gives it to you therefore for the counterfeit it's even easier he says if you have to deface the entire packaging then it's very difficult i'll get detected just day before yesterday an article has come out that in one of the countries around the world i forgot which country i'll tweet about it later i think yesterday that uh, the entire supply of the covid medicine that are reached there has is counterfeit and it's come from india but nobody has be, was we was is bothered to sort of do this but this will change more than 70% of the revenues of the pharma sector are lost only because of uh, counterfeiting and you look at the size of that 70% so when these changes come there will be a lot of catalyst and by the changes coming because now you are a credible shop you are a good chemist you've got an air conditioning you don't have expiry drugs you you basically follow a good prescription by saying who give you a recommendation what is your mobile number i want to add it into my system i will create alerts i will send the medicines to your home so all this transformation that happens in the healthcare segment will be a huge opportunity ahead so the point is again the benefit of one thing will, and now look at e vehicles now forget when it's going to come do you know the size of the replacement market like if you look at the entire size of cars in india you look at the size of trucks in india look at the size of three wheelers in india three wheelers are meant for supply of so many products and now you come and say i'm going to transform these and i'm going to make them e whether it happens in 22 23 24 25 but look at the sheer size the only difficulty is that if you are an established player in the automobile market a market leader you are going to cannibalize your own sale because you already have a market share and you have to replace your own petrol product with a e product therefore new leaders are likely to emerge there and those new leaders can dis- can disrupt the market in a big way when they disrupt they will create demand what will they create demand for people who sup- provide ancillaries and therefore the, that industry itself will become a very large focus industry if you actually see even in pli a lot of companies that have applied are from the auto ancillary statement now i don't own stocks of bosch but doesn't mean i don't listen to the management of bosch when they come and talk about the huge uh, investment that they are making in india or for example a shafler who came and declared results and they talked spoke about a huge capex or why is a company like sk bearing saying that the best three years are ahead we should give some importance to what they're saying that one year can be two years can be three years but it's not or timken i'm just giving it's all the four players that i've named uh, there's nothing left now in bearing but they're all talking about the same thing you think today okay butterfly whatever company i don't own that stock but there was an announcement that the company is for sale why did crompton and hewels bid for it the crompton and hewels are not silly that they feel that no the white appliances market is stagnated and there will never be a growth they know the huge potential that rural india holds we still in a situation look at it today you know you go you crossing a village they don't even have a fan so at some point they will go to a fan and look at the amount of people that will have a fan after all don't forget that india now has power india supplies power now if we are not sitting with the def- with the situation ki batti nahi ab and everything has to run so when they'll have a fan after some time they'll have for example an air conditioner after all if it came in ru- it came in urban india and you have found air conditioner everywhere come in rural india also B- because there was no reason to buy it when there had no bijli now they have bijli and they have the affordability because it's uh, the fa- by eliminating a lot of middlemen out of the farming sector or by ensuring that there is going to be you know more organized sectors like direct from farm organic foods uh, export opportunities better warehousing uh, reduction of wastages pill fridges oversized trucks and the intervention of court to say that that is not safe and all these are all going to be great opportunities warehousing logistics how can we have the growth of e-commerce in our country without logistics so there'll be great opportunities for because india ke andar look at the size of the country and the opportunity it holds it's a simple it's a simple uh, description we are not we are not in terms of infrastructure and i'm i'm very proud as an indian and i would you know i'm not saying it in a negative way but we are not commensurate to the infrastructure of where the rest of the world is today if you look at the milk industry and i don't own any stock i'm just giving examples the milk industry requires refrigeration the refrigeration capabilities were not there many years back we were doing a i was doing a legal matter for hindustan unilever to do with quality ice creams 
so we had gone into court to try and stop somebody from you know make making fake ice cream so the judge asked us do you supply your own genuine ice cream there we said no so the judge said why don't you supply so we had to explain that to buy a refrigeration unit where the ice cream has to be kept at a minus 18 degrees 20 minus 20 degrees temperature it to it is itself is a cost of about 8 lakh rupees for one outlet so if my ice cream does not have the demand of 8 lakh rupees how do i develop that infrastructure today that may change because you can find that innovation is creating after all don't forget like cadbury created that one small box na where you put all the chocolates why because they had a contamination pro- problem and mr bachan had to come and say now there is a double foil etc etc we all remember the cadbury controversy so the ch- the change there is going to be genuine and that change is a huge catalyst for multiple opportunities that may emerge because these are very large industries thanks safir i think uh, you you given very elaborate views about all of these different sectors uh, which uh, the audience has greatly benefited from uh, one qu- question that seems to be coming constantly in the dm from people who are not able to come up on stage themselves is around the ethanol sector and this whole ethanol transformation so would you like to share your comments on uh, how you see this whole thing playing out see but there's a difference when you have entered early <clears throat> and you're sitting with gains <clears throat> and a big difference when you are entering now because of a very simple reason that ethanol is a push from the government that push from the government has been uh, has resulted in a lot of collaborative efforts between the sugar companies and the oil companies that is the oil marketing companies and the uh, end result but today there is also a situation that some of these stocks have moved up so if i have bought as an example a company at 100 rupees and today you want to buy it at 400 my level of safety is very disproportionate to your level of safety because and why am i calling it a different level of safety because if something was to go wrong i will still end up making money and exiting but if something was to go wrong i am not sure where you will head so and why is there uncertainty vis-a-vis you compared to me because right now it's a it's the market has reacted to the ethanol story very well in the last 6 or 8 months this is not to say that i have sold of any one of my shares that i have on the ethanol side but the because when the market reacts very fast sometimes you want the company you want a few quarters to go by to see if the is the story going to actually become as big as it can and are there going to be any uh, uh, restraints for example let's take an example and i'll just give uh, give an example if you look at if you read the annual reports of some of the companies who which are not even into the business of sugar even they are setting up ethanol plants so i don't want to i don't want to jeopardize the situation where you discover that there is now too many people have gone into ethanol meanwhile hydrogen has come meanwhile for whatever reason some other alternate fuel has come and then what are you going to do with this because the idea is only to sustain an environment so buy it if you have to but buy it in moderation if the story gets better keep building on the conviction if the story stagnates you don't lose because get zero is better than negative can you hear me yeah 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 i don't yeah. know some messages come from previous space crashed i don't know somebody just put up a message anyway so uh, buy it in moderation and if the story is deteriorates then you are also not subjected to too much now look at the dynamics of the market i'll just give an example that this morning in the morning balrampur chini had cracked to 370 or 350 i don't know some crazy price it was down some 78% and at the end of the day it had recouped now relative to the market where the mid caps and the small caps were down 2% a certain currency when it does not fall becomes more expensive vis-a-vis other currencies unless the currency is so stable and it is got so much of certainty that and you are so sure about it that you come and say no it is worth the uh, the relative premium that it commands that is what the concept of opportunity cost is in economics we were always told that in you have to you have limited resources the resources have got unlimited uh, uh, use because every resource can get into something else and you have to make the most optimum use like you have money you have limited money 
that money is capable of multiple uses you can go and spend it you can invest it you can gift it you can whatever lose it you can do something but you have to put it to the most optimum use what is the most optimum use if you are hungry the most optimum use is eating food or thirsty but on the or if you are want to be celebrate you want to celebrate by hosting a party is it the most optimum use well it depends upon how important that party is to you another guy says i want to invest and i want to save like take my example i suppose i have a portfolio and today my portfolio is worth say x rupees now knowing that human life depreciates every year as in every year you're going closer and closer to eventually the end of life should i be putting that money to better use by improving my lifestyle or should i just believe in a bank balance that at one particular time i will finish my life and the money will remain and it will go in the hands of the next generation who may or may not be capable of managing it it's just a thought process so you have to bring a balance in your life for example i don't compromise on enjoying my life if i have to travel i will travel if i have to buy a car i have to buy a car if i have to go and stay eat a meal at a five star hotel i will eat a meal at a five star hotel because i do not know but at the same time i will not overdo it because i like the fact of investing i need the surpluses i need the savings it's good for my it's good for my mind if nothing else absolutely i i think those are really important pointers that we need to keep keep in mind when it comes to you know the the journey of investing uh going from step to step evaluating where and how you know capital allocation needs to happen because at the end of the day the capital is the same all across life and uh, you know all the capital is not uh, only investment capital but it's also uh, capital to invest in your own experiences and your own life and in your own fulfillment at the end of the day because as investors we uh, we don't want to invest in everything else besides ourselves we also want to invest in ourselves and we also want to you know focus on our own growth and our own development and and see how uh, how that makes us happier and more evolved as people uh with that let me uh, let me pass it on to uh, uh, chetan but before before i do that uh, it seems like a bunch of people are still trying to get into the space but uh, they they're using the wrong link so guys uh, uh just to ask the listeners for a favor i've i've put up the link to the uh, space that we're using right now uh please uh, retweet it so that other people can find it i'm not able to reply to all the pe- people in the dms who are able to, who are still searching for the link but if most of us retweet it uh, it it will it will automatically reach out uh, to the people uh, with that uh, just, I, where is your tweet i can't find where is your tweet you just put it up right now yeah 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 the one that starts with uh, previous space crash please join here Oh, the one that I see on your Twitter just says if you haven't joined the space already, you're missing out. Yeah, uh, that one's also fine. And any link, any any of the recent links will work. The one that you retweeted, right? Which is from Delhi Invest. I'll just yeah. retweet that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll just say link to join. Done. Thanks, Sophia. Chetan, please go ahead and ask your question. Hey, hi, Sahil. How are you, brother? Hello, Sahil sir. The hi, how are you? Yes, I'm fine, sir. Just wanted to ask this question, sir. That uh, in last four point five months, FIS have sold more than one point six two lakh crore worth of stocks. So, first question is, what do you make out of it? And the second thing is, I also track a lot of results of the companies, and uh, the results which I have tracked. The results were very good, as per my analysis. The only problem was with expenses and this raw material cost price, inflationary pressures. So I just wanted to know from you that what do you make out of it, and uh, these about these institutional selling. Thank you. So I don't make out anything negative about the institutional selling, and I will explain to you the rationale of that. That notwithstanding the uh, very high selling by the FIIs, which I do not debate because it is a fact. that amount of selling is very disproportionate to their ownership of the indian equity even after all this so it it is like if i have invested say 1000 crores into the market and i pull out 2 crores you cannot say that by pulling out 2 crores 
and that too are in a situation where typically some of their holdings may not have appreciated for example they own a lot of uh, kotak bank and hdfc bank which have not really appreciated in the last one year they are actually pulling out that money because it may be a part of many a scheme of many things for example the appreciation in the indian equity market between december between march 2020 and now uh, on their overall portfolio may have increased their india exposure many of them are uh, follow uh, msci balancing and fpse balancing some of them may have made uh, investments in other parts uh, don't forget the us market was extremely buoyant during this point of time and it is for many of these fis it is a home grown market in india they found a lot of opportunities to invest in ipos some of the ipos they would have now burned a lot of uh, their money but at that time when they invested there was an outright frenzy a lot of money is going into the private equity space because let's not forget that in the private equity space and we see all these unicorns and we talk about unicorns but most of the unicorns are funded by foreign money and the foreign money is got the same color the money the color of money doesn't change so there may be many reasons for them to have uh, adjusted to this uh, uh, thing the fi's will come back it is not now when they come whether they come back tomorrow or they come back after a week or a month or they come back after two months is not my guess because i don't have the competence to assume that but they will inevitably come back and when they come back the question is usually when the fi buying starts the di is selling starts it is it is not that the dis at that point of time are also buying the dis are bought and they also like to in cash at that point of time unless the retail participation remains very high in which case if the dis and the fis are both buying and the market goes into pockets of exuberance because there's too much of money chasing stocks then it becomes a problem for the fund manager to generate returns which is what some of the leading fund managers say they say you give us so much of money at the top of the market and you withdraw it when it falls like i'll give you an example if if right now you say mid caps have corrected say 20% how many people are deploying money in mid cap funds how many people are giving money to small cap funds or to or, you, or that's the problem that happens because that's the mindset we like to just chase momentum and the moment the market corrects we just want to withdraw if you are you'll do very well even if you're holding so that is the first answer and i'm not so perturbed by the fir movement i'm also uh, uh, see some of it while we have we, we are also seeing a complete transformation of the investment fraternity in india the investment fraternity in india is getting relatively more mature thanks to forums thanks to reading of books thanks to exposure now they it's not see when the market cracks as an as an example today if the market in the morning was down some 1300 points on the sensex the retail did not panic many people were saying okay we will buy a little bit into our favorite stocks and which is the correct way of investing now why is the 1300 points recovery became 300 points recovery whether it happened by retail whether it happened by domestic buying or it happened by fii covering uh, is a very difficult phenomenon to understand see by the way let me tell you something contrary the fii's are not sellers i don't agree at all with you because the fii net pulling out of india which looks very large to you is very small compared to the amount of money they pulled out from the rest of the emerging markets net to net india still got 2 to 3 billion dollars which may seem smaller compared to the past but add to this all the ipo money private equity money this money that money like for example if there is somebody says okay i have subscribed to a now some of these private equity funds that have come in some of the reit money that has come in is also very large no after all don't forget some of these fi themselves have become reits no a bridgestone aa gaya ya wo sorry so not bridgestone was called uh, what is that uh, b s f got the name uh the big uh, real estate guys is blackstone blackstone, blackstone. aa gaya country ya blackstone aa gaya ya koi aa gaya they're also very big no they're not like they have just changed their model and where are they and okay if you see in uh, towards the last part of 2021 many of the fi downgraded india so when they downgraded india because they felt the valuation have gone up maybe they want to buy the market but the market is not coming down they maybe they wanting to buy the market now i'll give you a test of this in between block deals happen they just mop up everything the block deal comes everything gets picked up in a matter of minutes so how does the block deals happen otherwise 
while i'm telling you that hdfc as an example hdfc bank has underperformed the market tomorrow this make an announcement at hdfc so for fii holding is available i think in a matter of 1 minute they'll take it so that is the nature of uh, their thing and i don't think we should attach too much importance what was the second question sorry that was just about is inflationary pressures and the margin pressures on the company and how do you make out of this result the company has shown the q3 results so inflation is not bad for stock investing there's a difference between inflation vis-a-vis stock investing and inflation vis-a-vis the manufacturing because in inflation when the asset values also have to inflate no because they, they, it's that's how it is as long as you are able to inflate the asset values it is also good my for example if i have real estate and the and there is inflation the real estate value will also go up now what happens is that in inflation currently the problem is that the raw material side is being impacted not by inflation it is being impacted by logistic problems by supply chain disruptions the supply chain disruptions are happening particularly because of semiconductors or because of depending on what your ingredients are for example there may be a restraint in terms of your ingredients sometimes the warehouses are not available the ships have got impacted the the baltic index you know in between at the swiss canal had got blocked and many other similar things the aviation sector was not fully functional so many flights were only able to bring necessities so when the supply side has been impacted inevitably the rule of economics is ki if the demand is more than the supply then the supply then more people will jump in in order to produce that's what happens capacity expansion goes up that is why i'm saying that it is a genuine probability that the capex cycle in india will turn even on the semiconductors you will see that there are so many announcements made in the last few days that xyz company will come and set up a semiconductor operation in india so over a period of time these inefficiencies of one kind will get reset and once they get reset i don't think that the raw material problem will last the way the market is behaving that they will last in fact the ceos don't believe that they even see sanjeev mehta of hindustan unilever is is a very very honest and a very straight forward person please hear his interview that came out a few days back i think it was either as as cii president of fiki whichever role he's in he made a statement that no they don't expect this to last and i have no reason to disbelieve him because it seems very logical see also try and understand that every every transformation causes a new gap the new gap creates a new opportunity and it moves into a new growth orbit for example when the lockdown happened let us assume i am talking from my own experience let us assume that as i became obviously all the my work started happening on a digital mode when it happened on the digital mode efficiencies of time set in because i was able to finish one call go finish next start the new next call within 5 minutes so typically when a client would come to meet me he would have to wait i left to travel my expenditure on travel got completely replaced i used to do a extensive travel all around the world that amount got replaced the paper cost got uh, saved because a lot of things were not being uh, you know produced on paper but there was use of more bandwidth there was use of more uh, for example encryption security uh, digitization so the nature of expense will keep changing and when that changes it will always create opportunities now if you look at it logistically i mean by, that is by common sense if the paper consumption fell because schools and colleges were closed offices were closed and why are companies in the paper sector reporting higher profits because the inefficient ones got wiped off and the supply side did not get increased so when the supply side did not get increased then what happened somebody would have said i need specialized packaging which needs paper somebody says i need recycling it needs paper amazon says i need this particular kind of paper because i have to deliver logistics it needs paper it got repositioned so if you were doing photocopying you moved to craft paper china started importing somebody said you know now i'm fascinated and i will launching my business and for that i want to send invitation cards and i want to send x y z whatever things in nature kept 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 changing so uh, uh, that's the nature so you have to keep finding the opportunity uh, and and placing your investment bets in a staggered manner based upon where the opportunity lies 
inflation is not going to kill a lot of businesses it will readjust thank you very much sir also you know i don't think the monetary banks in the world which are aware see rbi is aware of inflation rbi has done a great job uh, about to whatever extent with our with all this volatility around the world at the same time is the all the world banks keep sitting and keep talking about inflation so right from the us where to uh, uh, united kingdom to india to other places they're all going to monitor it and they'll probably take steps which is what they've been doing for such a long period of time it's just that sometimes the nature of steps may be very different and therefore somebody will come and say but i have no scope left right now on interest rates so i must do see quantitative easing was also an unprecedented event huh? a lot of inflation has come in by the circulation of money in the world now if that money is going to be sucked out then it is not that the inflation has to be high the inflation will also reduce if it was caused by one thing and that thing is taken out it should readjust according to that also no absolutely i think uh, the amount of money supply that comes in in itself uh, creates a lot of inflation and and uh, and this is something that we all as investors have to take into consideration the way in which that money supply is going to affect uh, inflation where in the uh, in the process of product development is that inf- inflation going to take place is it going to be raw material inflation is it going to be logistics inflation is it going to be intermediary inflation is it going to be inflation that will be passed on or not passed on and i think all of these questions are uh, are questions that uh that are specific to the kinds of companies and the kinds of sectors that you invest in and uh, you know you have to sort of uh, analyze and become a business analyst as much as you become a quantitative analyst because the whole picture is not going to be shown in the numbers if that was going to be the case then it would investing would be far easier than it is uh that being said let me just welcome glaston he's been waiting very patiently to ask a question uh glasni you can unmute and ask your question thanks krishna a uh, hi sophie it's wonderful to listen to a market veteran sharing valuable uh, sharing valuable insights and experience uh i'm i'm curious to know about an interesting idea that you had tweeted few weeks ago uh, about a small micro cap company swiss military consumer goods Uh, would like to know your approach while you decide to invest in such unknown companies like swiss military or maybe like rsl gear tech uh, in the past which has also been doing great performing greatly see i will comment generally i will not comment on the specific script because one script you may know about so many other scripts you may not know if to, today i may be invested tomorrow i may not be invested today my rational may be based upon certain premises tomorrow the companies may do something different and because we are not sitting in a situation where you know on a day to day or minute to minute basis i'm giving you inputs on uh, what i own etc it may be a very distorted information unless you are completely attuned to what what is happening that i'll give you a overall rational see there is my portfolio is classified between large caps mid cap and small caps i'm I, there is no there is no fixed formula where i say 33% has to be large cap 33 mid cap and 33 small cap because that will depend upon the opportunities that exist while you may have picked up two examples of companies that are small caps many people are aware of the fact and from my previous writings on for outlook business and i think one more publication uh, my uh, picks was was at that point of time was an ultra large cap bank which was which initially was icici and then became state bank of india and i'm both invested in both those counters so the point of uh, the point that i'm trying to make is that when i look at a company i have to look at where the company will lead me whether that company is transforming whether commensurate to its valuations book value in the case of banks or for example the profitability or whatever opportunity size export size transformation uh, etc is it commensurate to the market cap uh because why do i pick up uh, large cap because they have stability and they have the ability they already established leaders and if the leader is has been dented is like a zakhmi share then it has the ability to come back and roar and the uh, transformation in the management for example state bank of india's app itself is called yono which basically means you only need one 
it, it that's an acronym for y o n o and that itself is a very positive sort of an affirmation that they have made and a great uh, fr- from the perspective of uh, of the fact that it is a in house created app it's done a, it's a great thing that they've done i c i c i may have gone through a complete transformation if you look at the graph between them and hdfc they were continuously losing opportunities and now even somebody as credible as a kotak bank has applauded them for their efforts so uh, that's on the large cap when it comes to a mid cap segment mid cap companies uh, are once they have reached a certain traction level they have gone through a lot of cycles of ups and downs and when they have reached when they have lasted in those cycles then they reach the ability to move to the next orbit which is what as an example mr ramdev agarwal talks in his study when he says that in his case he likes to buy companies once they have reached the mid mid level not the small level because the level of destruction may have been uh, uh, done away with many of these companies will not go to zero so that brings, brings in a level of comfort why do i buy small cap because in reality it is a small cap that gives the highest return if you get it right because obviously the market cap is so disproportionate that if the company gets it right then it can become a very large return stock now what do i look in these companies i look at what is the company doing that is different from everything else i don't valuation will come second valuation means i don't have to see whether it is cheap expensive today there may be a company listed in the market at a 70 pe that actually may be the cheapest company because it has undergone the worst cycle and therefore the earnings have been impaired but there may be other companies that are at a 70 pe where they have not gone through a bad cycle they have gone through the best cycle and perhaps are entering into a tough arena so you will create a basket of stocks in that basket of stocks why do you remain diversified because it is very difficult to say that which one of these guys is going to be your best performer if today I, I, one of the stocks that i own which i am very happy did very well for me and is one of my largest holdings did i know when i go back in time that it was going to become such a good performer well not really because at that point of time something else was outperforming in the initial years then for example i said it comes from an industry that has not been able to demonstrate wealth creation except this company has created it in that industry uh i do not know what the promoter will do when the market cap goes up will he be too obsessed by market cap will he do frequent dilutions many other things will he make bad choices so that's why you create a basket and if the story remains intact and or it does not deviate substantially then you keep on adding to that basket in order to strengthen your portfolio also i do not bother so much on a company so people ask me why do you own so many stocks so i tell them when the stocks are doing well over automatically the self adjusting in my portfolio in terms of weightage when if my winners are becoming more heavy then i'm then automatically they are getting adjusted and what is it doing that basically means that those which are not turning out to be winners or are relatively lesser performers their value is diluting when the value dilutes if it becomes too inconsequential then i have to look at that company and say look i invested money here it's not worked out because my entire portfolio is done well or the market is done well and there is, is there something wrong in my thinking or is it just a matter of time because it's not necessary that the market comes and votes the same day so if it is a matter of time and you believe that this company is transforming and the market may be at judgment then you will have to satisfy your patience by saying look believe in me and if it is wrong then it is a very small price to pay to exit that stock and to add to your winners which is what i try and do So even today i'll give you an example even i'm not going to name but uh, today also i would have done a little bit of shuffle in my portfolio now if somebody raises a question and says do you have a very high churning rate in the portfolio by the way just for information i have one of the lowest churning rates in my portfolio because when i put a tweet that i'm buying and people say what are you doing look at it from 2020 march to now i think i've only exited three or four companies and the three or four companies for a diversified portfolio is not much now compare it to somebody who's got a 12 stock portfolio who does four companies he's done a 33% churn my churning is not even anywhere close to that because not even one of my winners i wanted to exit the only difference is if i bought a company a and that company a then went up a lot in value and it was likely to face a lot of competition because other players came in or it started doing something which was not uh, uh, 
pleasing or for like you know raising capital doing too many conference calls trying to talk the market up or for example anything that you are doing complex acquisitions that i cannot understand then i should be moving out because i'm being rewarded by the profitability to find the next opportunity and and wherever a gap is created it will be filled in by a so very articulate thought process but if you're too overloaded you will not have the ability to to sort of explore a new idea thanks afir i think uh, that uh, also sets the record straight a bit because people tend to assume that you have a lot of churn and that you go to cash and i'm glad that all of those you know uh, sort of uh, uh, misperceptions have all been cleared out and uh, you know that uh, understanding is clear around the fact that you have a low churn portfolio and uh, the sort of steps that you take uh, while constructing it i just so I never to... go to cash just to let, tell you no my cash like in december i went to cash it would have been 3% of my portfolio and i when what what does that cash really do when a cash is generated in my portfolio for a few days it gives me a lot of independence to think that i have money lying and i am sort of have the op- the i have the ability to find a new opportunity then my brain starts looking for that opportunity whether it is by reading whether it is looking at precedents or what is happening in the rest of the world by reading the letters of a lot of international investors because th- the industries there are much much more and then you start looking at examples in india for example suppose electrolyzers is right now massively in demand and and it's com- there's not a single listed company in india that makes electrolyzers and if i find an opportunity i will look at it and i'll say is there an opportunity suppose i'd found a company that was making it then i could have bought it if i believe that this in- company was good technology wise and opportunity wise but if i don't find the opportunity there then i don't have to force so what do i do then after certain point of time market it's not as if in market every all the horses are running at the same time some horses will be laggard compared to the market somebody will fall because of some reason etc etc like like i said one quarterly result comes out as a flash on television the stock is down 10% you come and say come on that's too harsh that company's management did nothing wrong the management is giving good commentary uh, etc and yet the market is being too harsh just because the expectations were too much or it was like buy on rumor sell on news whatever x y z then i have that money ready to deploy so i always will remain deployed because my idea of deploying the money is first to beat the fixed deposit i don't think it is so difficult to beat the fixed deposit by being invested because mota mota to you will get dividend also you'll get uh, a capital appreciation also because the market does go up so I, it's not so difficult for me and i do not have that mindset that i never go into this 20 30% kind of cash i can tell you right now i can decide tomorrow morning you give me money i can deploy it the question is that you must have a ready uh, you must have a ready list of what you want to buy so what do i do that's the advantage of smartphones when i'm for example sitting in my car if i get an idea i open my notepad and put it there or i write it on my ipad notes or whatever xyz notes and then if when, whenever the money comes i'm ready to deploy the only time when i will not deploy is if that idea has moved up too much beyond my buying zone and if it is moved up but the opportunity is gotten better then i will still buy it so i don't have a price fixation but if it is moved up just because the market has like suppose for some reason the market tomorrow goes up and some all the mid caps are up 2% then i don't have to wait because i still don't know in one day is the russia thing going to be decided or give me another opportunity because this is not an event as an example like a result which is like more certain to assess this is a little bit of a difficult event to sort of apply your mind to but i'm never 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 in cash thanks safir i think uh, uh, that was a really important perspective uh, and also gives people a bit of understanding around uh, uh, you know how to think about cash uh, we have our last uh, question uh, from from parvez uh, parvez you can go ahead and uh, and unmute yeah great thanks krans thanks krishna uh, safir lovely speaking to you again uh, i just heard you say about not being in in cash and uh, and deploying your cash all the time and being in the market all the time keeping that in mind um, you know what do you what do you propose as as a ideal uh, portfolio how many stocks would you would you prefer to have in a in a portfolio 
because if you're going to make meaningful money, you've got to have a concentrated portfolio with meaningful investment in there. Uh, and then, of course, diversify amongst the sectors and uh, various caps, et cetera. So um, just like to get to your view on uh, on what is the uh, uh, the optimum uh, portfolio that you would want to carry. No, there is no uh, right answer because there are people in this world who have made money with concentrated portfolios. There are people in this world who have made money with diversified. I'm not anywhere close to uh, that number or even, uh, you know, even a fraction of that. But Peter Lynch had 1500 stocks and he was beating the market outright. Uh, there are people there are people like Vanguard they who run ETFs and that ETF is running into so many stocks and there are ETFs all around the world and look at the kind of phenomenal record they've had. Now let me give you a hypothetical answer to this. Suppose as an example, I own 100 stocks but I beat all the funds. So why should I care? Why should I care? Because my role is that when something goes bad and inevitably it's not that you will it, things will not go bad. If they, when something goes bad how much will it harm me? Nothing. And what is market is not about getting it right. It is also about safeguarding yourself from getting it wrong. So let's take an example that I owned a stock. I'm just creating this. I did not, I don't own it. But let's assume that I own Dhani as an example. I'm, I'm taking up this stock because I'd written against it. But let me assume that I own Dhani. And it went wrong. And it was one person of my portfolio lost to that one wrong. That the 99 would have been able to subscribe me the way ahead. Now, let's take another example that I own a good stock and that good stock is at 1% exposure and the company does well. I It is my foolishness if I'm not adding to the positions while the company is doing well. So as the company does well, I get two benefits. One, that that 1% allocation is becoming better. So example, it doubles, it becomes two. But in the journey of that 1% becoming 2% or 3% or 4%, you're also trying, you're also moving towards those stocks. So as an example, my largest holding, one of my largest holding, not the largest or one of my largest holding, I bought even the, uh, in the last few days, despite the fact that the stock fell zero. In this entire market carnage, it hasn't fallen even one rupee. But I bought because if I find that the company is doing and I know that the weightage will go up relative and see also what happens is when you have outperformers, the outperformers are themselves readjusting weightage, which means they're diluting the uh, ownership of the underperformers. Now, when the market cracks, like it has denied now, I have to pick up my portfolio and look at it as if I owned a basket of currencies. And now I find that there's some currency that has fallen because something wrong has happened. It makes my choice of switching so easy. It is not such an easy choice when you have to deploy money. Because when you deploy money, money is an absolute value. You have a 100 rupee note that you have to buy a stock worth 100 rupees. That 100 rupee stock becomes 90 rupees. You know, you lost 10%. But when you're switching, it's not the same mindset because you know that you're switching from one currency to another of an underperforming category into a performing category when the performing category is corrected. It's a very different mindset. And, and one of the reasons for success in investing is you have, to, you have to continuously talk to yourself and you have to tell yourself what is going to work for you. There are people who make great money in small caps. There are people who make great money in commodities. There are people who make great things in, for example, businesses that are very complex. And there are people who make great money in simple ideas. They can all work. So I tell myself this. Any person comes and talks to me and says, but you own a diversified portfolio. I say, please bring me the best performing fund. Let's see whether we can beat the. And also let me tell you something. The best, the mutual funds themselves are so diversified. And, and yeah, but, Safi, but you know, you, you know, you, you, we're not against the, the not fighting against or, or going against or trying to beat the, the, the funds, right? Because most of the funds, as you know, don't even beat the, the index. No, but I'm giving an example so, of the best performers. If the best performing fund is up 30% and you are up, say, 32, then how did it matter? Now the best performing fund falls 10% and you fall 12%. How does it matter? That's not relatively such a bad show. The question is that you must, when your conviction is working right, when your stories are working right, you also have to build up on them. It is not that you will remain static and you will say, I bought it once in my life. Now I bought it 100, it's become 200, so what? It's become 400, so what? You will also keep adding, no? Yeah, that's where Buffett says, right? When you find, when you're so convinced and 
and you've got a you've got a margin of safety and you've got a great future ahead of the stock and you back up your truck and that's that's what i'm talking about is a concentrated portfolio where you've got you've got a pretty dis- diversified portfolio but it's concentrated so that you put meaningful money into it and you get meaningful returns uh, uh, when the scenario works out absolutely i disagree warren buffett does not have a concentrated portfolio he historically had a concentrated portfolio because he came at a time of baby boomers when the great depression had ended and he bought sizable stake in companies like coca cola gillette american express and but in reality today he owns 110 companies or even more and in reality he does derivative bonds and in reality is underperforming the market with his own newsletters he's admitting to the fact of underperformance because of this warren you know this morning i had to talk with one of my mentors a guy i really respect who's got more than 100 100 baggers he doesn't even come on television for interviews he told me that i've never met somebody in india who understood warren buffett correctly and this man is the one who took ramdev agarwal to meet warren buffett so you can understand warren buffett is so misquoted warren buffett is no, is not saying what you are believing him to be he is basically saying that if you find an idea your favorite holding period of the idea should be forever provided that that idea is working out and then you can keep increasing your position and it will uh, do whatever he buys junk bonds also he says he you the world says he is not buying technology his biggest position becomes apple then and then yeah, he, that's he, because he, of charlie he, munger yeah but that's see when when he bought it we said that it's not because of him it's because of the two people working for him then he bought for example he bought uh, the, the he had uh, the largest one of the largest holding in that in uh, uh, us uh, what is that company with the uh, with the chariots the, no no the uh, the finance company then scams happened there uh, so a lot of things happened in the market uh, wells fargo when wells yeah, fargo went fargo. wrong etc so point is and plus look at it no it, it, don't forget that his highest return came after 65 years of investing so in if i own my stocks in 60 years and and i've created a portfolio and by that see those were also companies that were very large american companies that became global companies like an american express became global or coca cola became different what was the big deal if you own coca cola in the last so many years how did it make a difference to you plus let's not compare ourselves without taking into account that warren buffett has a constant source of cash flows which is very critical which is why he how he structured berkshire and his insurance businesses if you have that kind of money coming if i am a if a guy if i'm a fund manager and every day i have inflows coming then i'm able to build up a lot of positions now warren buffett says that if i have this money coming every day i cannot go with the pains of trying to do own everything around town because it becomes very difficult for me to track therefore i opportunities are rare he repeatedly says that you do not get too many opportunities but if he does get opportunities it's not as if he doesn't invest no yeah and many times he buys back his own shares also and so um yeah thanks parvez uh thanks Safir, uh, any any closing thoughts before we wrap up? Well, all thoughts are opening thoughts, not closing thoughts. They all open our horizon towards many things in life. So, closing thought. There's no summary of what I said. Now, it was a general sort of a discussion. I'm happy if somebody has a point, and I can I can make a point on that. But I don't know what 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 should I close it with because it's not a conclusion. It's a work in progress. Let 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 me let me try and and put in a closing thought uh, that that would uh, encapsulate the magnitude of what you shared with us today. So, uh, guys, if you if you listen to the words uh, and and go beyond you know the surface meaning of what Safir has shared today, you will all have the opportunity to grow as investors. the the differentiation of of, of uh, different companies and uh, and uh, organizing a portfolio the way in which uh, safira shared it is not one that you're going to find in any book or in any 
uh, blog post it's built with years and years of experience and uh, insight and uh, it offers you as a as a listener the the, the different strategic uh, positions that you can take as an investor and how safir has successfully been able to combine those uh, those different strategies in order to generate a portfolio that would go ahead and uh, you know do, uh, do as well as safir has been able to do um what also really really stood out to me in today's conversation with safir has been his way of being uh, of going beyond the letter and interpreting the giants like warren buffett and uh, and charlie munger and uh, going beyond just what was written on the page to understand and collaborate that with his portfolio with his letters takes a lot of effort uh, to be able to do and he has shared those interpretations with us today for us to be able to you know uh, benefit from that he has shared a perspective on india and and helped all of us as investors get a lot of strength uh, in a moment which is which is uh, generally filled with weakness uh, in the market right now Uh, I've personally got a bunch of messages during this chat, and I think one or two speakers have also come out and said how uh, Safir has been a voice for reason in the middle of all this tumultuous volatility, and it has been fantastic to you know also understand Safir's uh, you know opinion on 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 the emerging sectors and the sectors he feels are going to be uh, going to play out going forward. uh just a disclaimer before we close that nothing shared here today was uh investment advice uh, and please do your own research and due diligence um and uh, uh only then you know go ahead and uh, make whatever decisions you, you need to um with that yes of you sir thank you so much for for coming out here thank you for giving me and delhi investors association the opportunity to host you tonight and we really really look forward to hosting you uh, many times more to come thank you everybody and thank you for your time and your attentiveness and good luck for recovery and better returns in in the times ahead good night guys good night good night sir good night krishna thank you